Hello, everyone. I'm Jacob Kyle, and I'm here with Mark Singleton, scholar and author of Yoga Body and co-author of Roots of Yoga with James Mallinson. I'm here today at the Yoga Reconsidered online conference to discuss the evolution of Mark's work and also to address some of the misunderstandings and misinterpretations of Yoga Body and its conclusions that have become popular among non-academic audiences, particularly in the yoga community. So hello, Mark. Thanks so much for participating in this conference conference. Hello, thanks for having me. So Mark, I'd like to start just, you know, with the beginning of your work, good place to start, I suppose, uh, with Yoga Body. And, and you know, obviously many people who are um, tuning into this conference will have heard of Yoga Body, whether or not they read it is another question, but it certainly has made a huge splash, you know, as you, as, as we know, in non-academic circles, especially in the yoga community. So, you know, just in case there are those who are tuning in who are not familiar with the book, would you mind just starting off by giving us a short summary of its thesis? Sure. The book is based on uh, the premise that in recent times yoga has uh, traveled and developed in very particular ways, culturally specific ways, that from, let's say, the mid-19th century, yoga starts to leave India and to travel around the world in a kind of process that, that we see very much still at work today. Uh, and that in that process, uh, you also find adaptation and innovation and different kinds of um, disciplines of mind, of body and of spirit, let's say, uh, becoming associated with yoga in quite uh, sometimes unprecedented ways. Um, so that's, that's the premise. And the, the main focus of, uh, of the book Yoga Body is what one scholar has, has uh, called modern postural yoga. It's a term that you'll hear uh, fairly frequently now. That's Elizabeth de Michaelis in her typology of, of different kinds of, uh, of modern yoga. Uh, and modern postural yoga is the kind of yoga that is characterized by um, asana practice, where asana posture practice is, uh, if, if not the only, then uh, probably the primary mode of, of yoga practice. And so in Yoga Body, the, the thesis is that postural practice has developed in quite specific ways in recent decades, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century, when there was a wider um, movement to popularize yoga and to globalize yoga to make yoga available in uh, kind of democratic uh, accessible ways and posture postural yoga was reformulated during that time in certain hands in order to make it uh, more accessible in order to make it more understandable so the frames uh, and through which people understood yoga were um, were quite different, let's say, than than they might have been in uh, uh, three hundred years previously in a traditional yoga pra practicing uh, context. Right. And so the, the book is really um, a an examination of that kind of cultural history, how and why it is that um, that your, that posture practice. And yoga more generally has changed. Uh, who were the who were the people that were um, reviving it or giving it new colors or a new spin? And uh, how did it? One one of the sort of secondary questions is how did we get here? How did we get to this place where we are today, where yoga is such a household name, and also where um, yoga is so predominantly associated with asana practice as it wasn't arguably uh, mm -hmm. primarily in in the ancient past let's say mm, mm. Um, so you know as we as we mentioned this this text which you know originally was intended to be an academic test text mainly has become you know widely embraced by um particularly the yoga community were you surprised by that popularity or did you sort of anticipate it Yes, I was, um, I was, I'm surprised. I'm still surprised by how, um, <laughs> uh, how, how frequently it, it seems to be, it seems to be cited and, and um, how often people seem to be aware of its existence, mm. um, even if, if they haven't read it and, and how sometimes um, people, even if they haven't read it, have, have quite strong opinions about, uh, <laughs> yes. about its contents. Um, yeah. So it, it was an academic thesis. 
however, it's an academic thesis that is on a topic that's, that's very popular. Right. Um, it, sometimes it seems like everybody practices yoga, or if they don't, they, they will next year. They intend, <laughs> you know, like yeah, everybody has, it's, yeah. A, it's on their New Year's resolution. That's list. right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, and that popularity, uh, as you say, it's like people have strong opinions, whether one way, one way or another, and, and it, the text seems to have been, and as you point out in, your, in this really interesting and refreshing you know, uh, if I can say it, call it that, or introduction to the Serbian addition to Yoga Body, in which you talk about the way it's been kind of appropriated by a number of different agendas, some that celebrate the book and some that, you know, uh, have a lot of criticisms of the book. But a lot of this, you know, co-optation has been, hinges upon what you say are, you know, pervasive misunderstandings and misinterpretations of what your intentions were and also, you know, really the, the, the nuances of the thesis. So um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what those misunder misinterpretations have been? Well, some of the most common are that um, I'm claiming that, that yoga was a, a recent invention. Right. Um, or more specifically, that um, that asanas have been invented in recent times, um, <laughs> and I think partly that arises due to the the subtitle of the book, which is the origins of modern posture practice. Yeah. But what I'm doing, in fact, is describing contexts in which postures, which may or may not have existed before, uh, are given new interpretations, are given new uses, and are played out, are practiced in in different settings. And so, <clears throat> if one wishes to see, um, as, as many do, you know, a sort of an argument about origins. Yeah. Um, of course, that's a hot political potato. Um, right. Then one's going to focus on, on the fact that, of course, you know, asanas aren't new. Of course, they aren't invented. Um, and so the, the uh, lots of the, uh, the responses that I saw to the book were... Uh, were sort of attacking it on those terms. So it, as a kind of a, a straw man, I suppose. Yeah. Um, saying that, well, you know, obviously it, it's not invented, but that's not a, a word that I use to this process in the book, um, apart from um, where I'm, I'm citing uh, Dharma Mitra, a, a New York based uh, yoga teacher who says that every day people are inventing new postures. So th there is, um, that is a place where misunderstanding can occur and which I think has also raised very um, interesting questions that maybe we'll, we'll do later about the, the politics of yoga and also yeah. the, the position that scholarship um, situates, it, situates itself in with, with regard to that, that kind of those political tensions. Um, another, um, say the, the, the kind of converse of that is, um, an idea that, that what I've done is to show that uh, because there is a, a measure of adaptation and um, innovation uh, and, and great change sometimes within yoga itself and the, and the way that it's practiced, um, is to say that uh, yoga is entirely up for grabs, that, it's, right. uh, that you can take it and you can run with it, you can do what you want with it. Um, and it'll still be yoga because change is not only, um, you know, characteristic of the modern period, but um, as, as I think I, I also say in, in that book, it's very much characteristic of uh, the yoga traditions as, as a whole. Things change and things adapt. And that's something, you know, in, in, a, in the roots of yoga that, that we see very clearly, this, this kind of adaptation. So the, those two, it's sort of, it's odd that the book has been taken to support very, very different agendas. One that would um, innovate and, and create afresh and, um, and sort of take yoga away from those, uh, those earlier contexts. And one uh, that, that really would, would sort of, you know, take, take it as a, um, uh, as a means to assert those origins and the hold that they, that they, uh, that they should have and the influence that they should have on practice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to sort of reiterate what you just um, said, you you know, you remark in the in the introduction that that these misinterpretations lead to two conclusions: one, that we need to get rid of modern bastardized forms of yoga and return to the roots, 
um, which is sort of, you know, that's more or less what I have found <clears throat> is the common refrain. And, and usually it's not even that we need to return to its roots. It's just sort of like, this isn't yoga, you know, modern yoga isn't yoga. Let's call it something else, ca modern calisthenics, whatever, and just throw, you know, completely throw it out. And then the second conclusion, um, you know, as you mentioned, is that since yoga is a construct that it's there for the, for the reinventing, which I wasn't quite as familiar with. I wasn't quite as familiar with that one. I it feel, it feels to me like, um, at least what we see here, um, at least in the New York yoga scene, it's usually, this book is usually used as like, uh, uh, as you mentioned that it wasn't supposed to be interpreted as, as a, as a means to debunk modern yoga or to bust the myth of modern yoga in that, in that way. And so I want to read a quote that you wrote because, again, this could just be sort of um, uh, rehashing what you just said, but I really like the, the, the quote here. So, um, for example, if one frames the modern physical culture movement as the origin of popular global hatha yoga practice in the early 20th century, one invites the predictable and with certain qualifications correct counter argument that such practice originates, in fact, in Indian traditions of hatha yoga. If one instead frames modern physical culture as one, albeit vital, context in which certain varieties of early 20th century hatha yoga flourished, one finds oneself on rather different ground, where it becomes possible to appreciate that a multiplicity of contexts have contributed to the nexus of embodied meanings that find expression in this hatha yoga, including, without a doubt, pre-modern forms of hatha, but also and crucially, including modern physical culture. The first frame in invites polarized and, to my mind, sterile right versus wrong debates. The second, on the other hand, maintains the possibility of an ongoing collective scholarly adumbration of yoga's context in all their social, cultural, and historical complexity, <clears throat> end quote. So I, I, what I really like about this quote, you know, and what I feel like you're really offering in this introduction is that you know, it's it's a lot more nuanced than that. It's not a it's not an either or. It's more of a both and, and that there's nothing that <clears throat> frustrates you know that destabilizes the identity of yoga in uh, by pointing out that there is a kind of disjunction. There is a, a, a moment of a renaissance in its history. Can you talk a little bit about why people feel so? Um, uh, uh, strongly about the need to see a kind of continuous historical trajectory without disjunction? Yes, I, I think the motivations are, are different um, for, for different people. And, and here, you know, I'm, I'm only speculating, really, um, as I you know, yeah. look into people's uh, psyches. Um, but I, I imagine that, um, well, the uh, the sense that that yoga has kind of run away from um, its its sort of you know cultural uh, cultural home or has sort of you know come come loose of its cultural moorings and has been has been taken in a way that that to um, many people who who belong to cultural contexts in which yoga is traditionally practiced find quite alarming um, that with within that um that from that perhaps comes comes an impulse an impulse to insist on the the integrity of yoga and and the sameness of yoga because what we see is in some respects fission almost you know that like a, a just a proliferation of yogas that that um I was going to say increasingly have have less to do with you know with that tradition, but that that's not true. It's more complicated than that. But which often have um, you know a, a very far from uh, from yoga's cultural origins, uh, and so I imagine that that one response is that to you know to see that, and and then from from the other side, the other side from practitioners um, who are um, who who don't have who aren't born into or you know don't don't belong to um a culture or a religion um that that typically has practiced yoga that has traditionally practiced yoga um perhaps there is there's also um but but for whom the you know these practices are vital you know that they, they are part of their daily life they're part of the the fabric of of, of their being that you know they're a spiritual path which isn't um you know which is which needs to be authentic 
Um, and sometimes that authenticity is associated with um, a kind of purity of origins. Yeah. Um, it's associated with, uh, you know, a, a, a long tradition which has its, has its roots in, in India. Um, and so to, in some respects, disrupt that kind of narrative um, with the idea that, that yoga can be multiple or that, that it can, that it has always changed and grown. And in fact, different yogas have, have been in conflict with each other, um, is to complicate um, perhaps what's perceived as, as, a, as quite a simple need for, for, a, you know, for an authenticity identified as, um, uh, as a kind of a purity, or as a kind of purity of lineage or something right. like that. Thank mm -hmm. you.